<laughs> all right, hello everybody. Uh, we're back up and I'm pleased to welcome you all to our next panel uh, where we'll be talking about cybersecurity solutions, educating future leaders, a topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, so we have three great panelists today and I'll just have them quickly introduce themselves if you go down the line. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Tony Bay. I'm the Director of Federal Practice over at Align. Hi, Tammy Hudson. I'm Cybersecurity Relations Officer at Wells Fargo. My name is Brad Bentley, President of Fast Forward and in charge of Employer Outreach for the Purdue Cyber Apprenticeship Program. Great. So we're going to dive right in with questions and I'll be looking at the audience. If you have anything, just raise your hand. But we all know right now cybersecurity is one of the hottest jobs some people like to say that there's negative unemployment in this space. So Tammy, I'll start with you. How did we get here and what has caused this workforce shortage? Yeah, so great question. Um, honestly, I think it's been a paradigm shift. I think previously and years ago in cybersecurity, the entire objective of cybersecurity was to secure the perimeter, right? So keep the bad actors out. And I think what we've seen in the past few several years is that that has changed. So we still need that very technical, almost esoteric skill set that we used, that we needed previously, but now we're looking at it in more of a triad. So we, we're looking at it from a people process and technology perspective, and the skill sets needed not only to secure the perimeter, like I stated, but how do we become more secure and vigilant and resilient? So standing up those capabilities and controls really to defend um, against the current landscape today and then what may be coming beyond. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, the, the paradigm shift or the change in mindset, because I think in the past we all thought it's IT, right? It, security is just a subset of IT, so people could just, we could just get our sysads, our network engineers to handle it, and then it was a fire forget. You set it once, you never have to monitor it or maintain it. And that's obviously demonstrated that that can't happen. It never could, but that was the mindset of a lot of leadership. So. That's where I think we've finally realized that you have to have people that do cybersecurity as their full-time job, that maintain the, the, the monitoring, the, the implementation, and, and understanding of the, the, threat, the, the threat landscape so that they can maintain the protection of their system, the information systems, and ultimately the, the data of the, of the organization. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add to that is we have an aging workforce. Uh, certainly concerns that are out there and technologies really evolve faster than we've taught people how to manage it. Absolutely. And so, Tony, when it comes to this shortage and this paradigm shift, ultimately, are you optimistic? Yes, ultimately I am. Um, it's not going to be easy. Uh, you, know, the, we, you know, when I talk to people, uh, especially whether it's hiring or just talking to various members of the industry, it's people just make this big bubble or cloud around cyber, where cyber is just as a diverse of a industry area as IT. What do you want to do in cyber? And we have to start keying in with the companies of when we talk about cyber, it's just not this big amorphous thing, but what are the specific capabilities we're looking to implement to protect the data according to the, the priorities and, and the business objectives of that organization? I mean, is it obviously data security, but are we more concerned with threat actors attacking our network, so we have to pay greater attention to our border gateways or things of the nature. Are we, is there more of a concern to corporate espionage and insider threat? Obviously, all those things have to be considered overall, but what are the keys to the kingdom that you definitely want to protect? And that's where you concentrate your resources on to hiring the people that are knowledgeable in those areas. So Brad, have you seen efforts to address the problem? And if so, what seems to be working and what's not? Well, uh, this will be a long answer, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think there's been uh, significant recognition, first of all, uh, by both industry and government on the severity of the problem, um, both at the workforce and really the cyber threat level. Um, and, and we've seen an increase to focus on the efforts to address the problem. Uh, you heard the words earlier, I think uh, both my, the panelists have said the words paradigm shift already today. And, and I really think that's what it's going to take by all parties involved to take a longer term approach uh, to expanding talent sourcing uh, and pairing that with structured training. So our program is funded by the Department of Labor. So uh, I will say I do think the government is doing their job, uh, especially the Department of Labor, 
uh, after eight decades of doing things the same way, they came out with a new concept actually under the Obama administration a few years ago. They took a group to Europe. They were studying uh, apprenticeship models that are used uh, throughout countries over there as a way for workforce development. And they brought that back to the states. So in 2016, they introduced something brand new, uh, the concept called industry intermediaries. It was initially a 200 million plus uh, investment made by Congress uh, to create industry intermediaries in several sectors. Uh, it was transportation, hospitality, healthcare, manufacturing, the building trades, and IT. Uh, I think they were all of the initial ones. And this was actually something that started in January of 2017, and it was one of the few initiatives that carried over to the Trump administration. Um, and what started happening, though, the IT intermediary at the time, uh, although they were doing broad-based IT occupations, they were finding from all the employers that they were trying to work with that cyber was the most in demand. So the Department of Labor uh, just this past year created a separate industry intermediary a company called Safal Partners to solely focus on cyber. Uh, now, along the way, uh, they also created several funding opportunities to try to tie education into this. Uh, they put a $185 million investment a couple of years ago where education consortiums had to be the primary as the grantee. Uh, that's where Purdue and our PCAP program came into play initially. And with that funding opportunity, there were only three colleges and universities that were grantees. A year later, though, uh, they invested another $100 million, and you started seeing this trend because 18 of those grantees we're all either doing cybersecurity and or artificial intelligence. So we, we kind of saw that trend coming there. Um, now, as far as what's working, um, first and foremost, it, it, I just mentioned all the different uh, education institutions involved with this. We're seeing job requirements starting to change and you're starting to see the language in those job descriptions starting to change as well. Uh, and, and that's lowering the barrier to entry. Uh, industry certifications are being valued just as much as the four-year cybersecurity degrees. All the groups that I just mentioned that, that have these grants, if you took the number of people that are graduating with a traditional four-year bachelor's in cybersecurity combined, that's only about 10,000 people per year. And we all know the stats. At, at, at the low end, it's at least 300,000 that are needed. Um, now, Purdue, they signed my paycheck, so I have to say this. Right. They still have the traditional four year degrees. They have uh, associates. They have master's programs through articulation agreements. But it would be hypocritical of me to sit here and talk about paradigm shifts without us being willing to do exactly that. So what Purdue did was revamped our PCAP program. We now offer uh, accelerated programs all online, uh, eight and 16 week programs uh, to train, educate and upskill people, uh, a level one program after eight weeks will have somebody at the level they can test for a CompTIA Security Plus industry certification. Eight weeks later, they would be at the place where they could test for uh, a certified ethical hacker designation. So uh, what's not? Uh, poaching is something that happens in this industry. And Tony and I had this conversation earlier. I don't want to spend too much time on all that. He, he may address it with some other comments. Uh, and I think COVID has been talked about a lot today already. But the one thing I'll mention that's really recent related to that, we work with a lot of defense contractors with, with PCAP. Uh, one of the early companies we talked to was Raytheon Technologies. And just yesterday, their CEO was interviewed by Reuters uh, because of the upcoming uh, vaccine mandate, December the 8th, that goes into effect for defense contractors. And he's projecting that he's going to lose thousands of, thousands of employees. And a lot of those are going to be uh, cybersecurity talent. So. It's not a political statement on my part, but it's certainly a consideration, especially for groups like those defense contractors. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick poll of the audience since we do have some cybersecurity professionals here. Um, completely voluntary. So how many actually have a degree in cyber? And then how many have a cyber certification? Validates the point. Yeah. yeah. So any other any other comments from the panelists on, you know, the degree programs versus the certification programs? I mean, the only thing I'd say is the, the way to build these these members is really to concentrate on what we're going to want them to do on the entry into the field. Right. So education is important, but I think training is a bit more important in the beginning because we want them to be able to step into roles and do things like 
work in a SOC as a analyst and audit the logs and, and, and find out those, those signatures to say, oh, am I being hacked? We need to investigate this, right? Do you absolutely need a degree for that? No. Does it help? Definitely, yes. You understand the, how it fits into the overall picture. That's why I think, at least from a business perspective, certifications are going to be a little bit more important because they're going to at least provide you a specific training in a specific niche area of the cybersecurity, um, especially like I love to see the vendor certificates that shows that they know how to use, say, Tenable NESA scanner, you know, a vulnerability scanner of some sort, or they know how the switches and routers work and how to set up the access control list and things of that nature. So I think we just need to make sure when we build these people, we give them realistic expectations of what they're going to be doing when they first step into the field. Yeah. I think um, it, it's interesting, and I say this as somebody with an MBA and advanced degree, if someone were to get a, a degree in cybersecurity and if they had gotten one two years ago, that would be outdated now. So, so much of it is how do we outpace the threat actors? How do we out innovate? How do we stay ahead? And part of that is education and training and being prepared, but part of that is upskilling and, and really um, looking beyond, I think, our traditional IT business model or talent strategy. So what does, what does cyber talent really look like? What's the face of cybersecurity? And I think that's evolving. And I think the organizations now, and, and we're all challenged to really think outside the box, not only from a um, age, gender, race perspective, but um, thinking about that, that entire cognitive diversity. So really attracting neurodiverse candidates or candidates that don't think like we have in traditional IT have thought about things and process things. Yeah, I would say, especially for those that are, when we're looking at those entry levels of stuff, if someone has a liberal arts degree, definitely don't discount those. Because if you can train them right, they're already trained in critical thinking, which is absolutely necessary for the cybersecurity field. Mm -hmm. um, I have people that we brought on, you know, straight hires with a history degree. Turned out to be one of the best cybersecurity analysts I ever, I ever had on my team, right? I've worked for people that were CISOs, but their degree was in history or anthropology. I mean, it, yeah. the, the key thing right there, what you're talking about is what's the face? The face is someone that shows an aptitude for learning, a mm -hmm. desire for learning, and the ability to think critically about the situations that they're given mm -hmm. and make those judgments. Yeah, I think those are really important points. And a lot of times if, you know, a candidate's applying and there's an algorithm that's being run, you know, you might not see those resumes. And I think it's super mm -hmm. important to ensure you have that diversity. We have mm -hmm. a few neuroscience majors on our team and they're a really strong addition to the mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. You know, I myself have a master's in communication culture and technology, which can be a mouthful, but I think it makes sense why I'm here. But, <laughs> you know, it's not a traditional cybersecurity uh, degree. Um, so Tammy, you know, do you think the answer again to this workforce shortage, and we've been touching on it, is to educate and train early? And if so, how early? I think it's part of it, absolutely. I think um, training helps us be aware of the risk and helps us prepare and, and um, be effective and efficient. But, but I think it's holistic. It's really looking at what the risks are and what we think they will be tomorrow. So looking at that evolving threat landscape training, educating, continuously training, and continuously making sure that we have a cyber-ready workforce is part of the solution, um, indeed. And I, and I think that, I, I really don't think we have the full answer. And I think that's why we have the cyber skills gap that we do today. I will go back to the point, um, and I'm just a huge supporter of diversity within this field. So as we mentioned, looking at those HR professionals or those risk professionals, um, or, or someone from, uh, the legal realm and really bringing those various perspectives together so that, that we can fill these positions and not only fill them, but fill them with great candidates who can add value and who will challenge us to think about these solutions differently. So if you think about it, you know, what I'm really talking about is the art of the possible. What's possible and how do we address that and how do we do so uh, immediately and how do we challenge ourselves to continue to do so? Yeah, and I think a, a really key component too is making sure you have that partnership amongst the organization with your human resources, with your people team, and with your training and development organization if there is a separate organization to map those kind of career paths and figure mm -hmm. out where is that continuous training? What are those milestones we should be setting? Um, Tony, do you want to talk a little bit more about training and how that's kind of integral to what 
to what you guys do at Align? Uh, sure. So, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, every company is encountering the shortage. And um, with Align, what we do is we're a cybersecurity auditing assessment company, right? So, you know, for federal, I'm sure if anyone come here has heard about the up and coming DOD CMMC program or FedRAMP or anything based on the NIST 853 controls outside the federal government. That's what my team does. And it's hard finding those people. It's hard at least find someone that's an experienced hire that you may want to spin them up in a minimum amount of time, say a month or two, so they can run projects and do these assessments. What we finally realized is that that's not sustainable. You can't just go hire experienced people because one, they're not out there and two, they're a hot commodity, right? There's not a whole lot of them. And that's with any aspect of cybersecurity. So what we're doing at Align is we're um, committing to developing a training pipeline of our own so that we can train people to do things the right way as we see them um, and to be able to perform these jobs with, with an assumption of zero experience in the field. So we're laying out how do we do this from the soft skills, consulting with clients and being able to pre make presentations and speak confidently and, as a professional consultant and then doing the hard assessment work, understanding the, the technologies in general. So we're, we're planning out a, a pipeline and it's not going to be short. It's not like a three, four month quickie type thing. We're talking on the job training with, with you know, peer mentoring and shadowing on, on things. And then, you know, we expect this to happen and get someone really skilled, probably in about anywhere from 12 months to 24 months. But that's the commitment we, we have to make to, to handle this. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen it. I've kind of talked with, with my other panelists um, prior to, to sitting up here was, I've had job openings open for eight, nine months before I can find someone qualified to meet that. And that's just not sustainable. It's not realistic for any company. Brad, what is the best way to introduce the topic of cybersecurity and encourage students to begin their path in the field? So I'll, I'll definitely get to that. But I I do want to touch on the age thing just for a second because I don't think there's necessarily a silver bullet and it, a lot of programs are still in their infancy, but you're starting to see a lot of things underway to get younger and younger and younger. So I, I know there's a, a push right now, for example, for a, a national alignment to align cybersecurity learning criteria across all 50 states for K through 12 and states are going to have the option uh, to adopt those standards prior to the 2022-23 school year. That's through cyber.org. Um, I mentioned Safal Partners earlier, uh, who is the, the intermediary specific for cybersecurity. They're actually doing some things on the state and local level. They're, they're piloting a program right now in North Dakota where they have about 40 uh, public and, and uh, private sector partners uh, for an initiative they're calling the K through 20W initiative. So it's, it's kindergarten all the way through PhD and workforce uh, where they're trying to uh, utilize a slogan of every student, uh, every school cyber educated. Uh, and then one more that I'll mention that's really targeted toward the, the, the teenage market, if you will, um, at least at the beginning, is through another DOL grant. It's a CYAI, I believe that's the Cyber Youth Apprenticeship Initiative. So they're targeting 16 to 21 year olds uh, and it's actually uh, managed by uh, ICF, which is a global uh, consulting and technology firm. It's actually listed on NASDAQ, and I know they're training 900 people into apprenticeships between now and 2024. So again, those are just some examples. So I don't know that there's a, a perfect answer for how, how young should you start. Uh, there's already been a lot of talk today about the Girl Scouts. Uh, I know that CISA has another program. I don't know if it was mentioned in her panel or not. Uh, there's a uh, an organization called Girls Who Code. So you're starting to see uh, a, a lot of those type of initiatives that are there too. But to your question, so, you know, how do you introduce it? Um, you know, it can't just be about classroom learning. Uh, schools uh, and employers need to work together because kids need practical, you know, hands-on real life work experience. But students today are unlike when, when I came through, you know, they're digital natives. There's never been a time in their life when they didn't know a world or the internet didn't exist. Uh, their lives revolve around that digital space. So the technology is not unfamiliar to them. It's not scary to them. Uh, but the educators have to work more closely, in my opinion, with industry to help those students connect their interest in, say, gaming, uh, as an example, with careers like penetration testing, ethical hacking. Uh, and, you know, the students don't know that some of what they find interesting about the digital experience is directly related or linked 
to creative, interesting, and well-paid jobs. And, uh, you know, you have hackathons, you have these cyber competitions, they're great for kids, but to really understand future work opportunities, there has to be a connection to those employers uh, so that they know that uh, what they're learning can be applied uh, in a practical sense. And the educators, though, themselves don't often know what those opportunities are. So that circles back to the employers whose job it is to help the educators learn about those specific occupations. And, and finally, the career and technical uh, education programs need to be expanded. Uh, I think where more students are able to pursue those cyber careers, uh, maybe at the high school level or, or even lower. And I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, the, the numbers don't lie. Uh, you know, highlight the fact that there are career paths, there's long-term job security. Uh, we can sit up here, all of us could spout stats all day on the openings that are out there, but uh, one I like to use is the U.S. Um, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics has estimated a 33% growth in cyber through 2030. So, you know, why not highlight that as long-term opportunities? I don't know if any of you saw the article. I I think the, ex I'm not sure the exact details, but last year during exam time, there was a school where uh, a group of high school students had gotten together to DDoS the, uh, the system so they wouldn't be able to take their final exams online. So I think, you know, COVID obviously has added an interesting dynamic as well when every kid's remote, right? So they have right. these skills, they have these, you know, uh, tool sets now and very creative to not taking your final. <laughs> Um, so in the same vein, Tammy, you know, who is responsible for educating the future cybersecurity generation? Is it the schools? Is it the parents, the public, or the private sector? And how do those all play together? Yeah, um, great question. I, I think it's all of the above, honestly. I think that it's the academic institutions. I think it's um, parents just being a, a strong force and a, an influencer there. Um, definitely the government. I think it's all of those acting in concert in order to educate. Our, our education system in this country is built to teach a, a certain level of skills and uh, a modicum, at least, level of skill sets in order to be productive, in order to, to really live our daily lives. And I think part, part of that, and Brad kind of hit on this, in this very technology-infused culture, part of that is teaching cybersecurity, not necessarily for the person to work in that as a profession, but only if as much to protect their own data, right? So um, educating them on, on how to be cyber safe on the internet or, you know, when, the, when they're on various parts of the social media, I think that's definitely part of it. I think it was um, Winston Churchill that said the price of greatness is responsibility. And I think we have a, a phenomenal responsibility every uh, every organization across industries across the private public sector to really collaborate in order to fight this uh, cyber war that we're in yeah any other panelists want to chime in well i mean i think tammy hit it right on the spot i mean there are programs out there it's just more of i guess people need to be more aware of them and, and, mm -hmm. and that falls on everyone as soon as they hear it to to work with whatever organizations they have to help further develop it or at least just promote promote who they are. For example, you know, I mean, Brad mentioned, so uh, my son's a Boy Scout, Boy Scouts of America. They have a cyber chip program, which mm -hmm. is cyber safe that promotes cybersecurity education. There's Girl Scouts have, and my daughter's a Girl Scout, and they have a cybersecurity education um, badge as well throughout their program, and they've made it age appropriate. Um, I, I know from more me being retired Air Force, the Air Force Association, I believe, is one that, that sponsors the Cyber Patriot program, which sponsors teams of kids to go out and do capture the flag events that teaches them the hard technical skills that are interested and they they advocate for people to sponsor to be their mentors for these teams where especially with the industry aspects of it so there are all these programs aware is just we need i guess more of, i would love to see is somehow consolidate a a running list of what programs are available you know the appropriate ages for them because they're already out there could we use more definitely but we need to get the word out and that's for us as an industry as a whole. Yeah, I guess, you know, I've, I've probably talked enough about the government, uh, you know, employers, uh, some of the other ones. But I, I, I do think it is worth mentioning parents. You know, the, the world has changed a lot, especially in the last couple of decades, you know, especially since the Internet came out. And, and kids now hold the power of their world, you know, in the palm of their hands. 
uh, with their cell phone. And, and social engineering and all the negative things that can happen on social media, uh, parents in general need to be more cyber aware. And uh, many of them from uh, you know, my age group didn't have that luxury um, from uh, you know, already being in the workforce before the internet and other things came out. So the good news is though, you're seeing things on a grassroots level, you're seeing communities step up, doing workshops for parents so that they can be more aware of what to watch for for the children. So, uh, but the, the overarching answer is it's a combination of everything. And I think we shouldn't also discount really small wins because that also just helps set the scale. Mm -hmm. um, our daycare just went with an online app and you know it, I emailed the director and was like, so what's the security of this app? How are you protecting my daughter's data? <laughs> of and she did. that was not something that had ever even entered her mind sure. mm -hmm. was that she would consider and I say, okay, get me in contact with their IT director. Let me review their industry certifications. When was the last time they did a pen test? And this poor woman, but you know, <laughs> 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 even those, you know, even just setting that, you know, mm. she's responsible for a large group of daycare, a lot of kids, a lot of parents, and sure. even just beginning that conversation yeah. helps it's a very small step forward in understanding yeah i mean it's just learning to ask the right questions i mean especially with the internet of things we all understand amazon echo google google dots and everything i mean i remember when sonos came out the the wireless speakers i mean i think i broke the the, the av section at best buy when i went in it's like they introduced it's like oh so this sets up on my wireless network what's the encryption level on this and they're like uh, and I saw five Best Buy techs searching their phones <laughs> on the web funny. trying to figure it out, <laughs> which is at the time AES 256 at the time. So that's finally able to find answer. But it took me like 20 minutes to look it up. So we've talked about, you know, the workplace shortage, the responsibility, you know, across the board of educating. But there also still is a pretty significant lack of diversity in the cybersecurity field. You know, Tammy, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Um, that's very close to my heart and, and, and very true. It is a lack of diversity. And I think the, the onus falls on each of us to try and make that field more diverse. And I, I hit on this earlier. I, I'm very passionate about um, women in technology and mentoring girls in technology through the STEM and STEAM programs. And the, uh, the institutions that I graduated from, Georgia Tech and Duke, very involved in that and with my own two daughters and my son still have, having those conversations with them about what it means um, and how to get into the field and what that field looks, looks like right now and what it should look like. So I'm hugely passionate about that. I think there is a very high correlation between diversity and performance, and we need to think about these attacks differently. We need to think differently. And the way to do that, one of the easiest ways to do that is to bring in more diversity into the field. And Brad, you know, what kind of, how do leaders really help shape that diversity and what can they do? Well, selfishly, I'll, I'll talk about this from the, the DOL industry intermediary perspective first, because uh, those contracts are about um, five years in now, we're just renewed. And one of the new requirements by this administration is to focus on the DEI side of that. And even in our reporting, uh, there's a lot more emphasis on that. So, uh, and there's a lot of funding that's also attached to that. So utilizing, whether it's a PCAP, whether it's a Safal Partners, uh, there's an opportunity for uh, companies to be able to complete these programs with inducement funds, maybe to kind of kickstart their programs, for example. Uh, we have, uh, we, we call them Kickstarter funds, those level one and level two certifications I mentioned earlier, uh, where a company doesn't have to come out of pocket. Uh, not only for those two eight-week curriculums, but also for sitting for those industry certifications. There's buckets of money that are sitting there. Uh, and with some of the other contracts that are out there, there's just straight up money that'll go that the companies can utilize for whatever they wanna do. We see most people uh, focus on diversity with that though, because again, it's such a, a huge focus with the current administration. One thing that I recommend though, to all employers that I talk to, uh, one of the quickest ways to diversify your workforce is to recruit from the military. Uh, over the years, you've seen uh, a lot more diversity in the military. And, and Tony, by the way, thank you for your service. I know you talked about that before earlier as an Air Force veteran. Um, but we've certainly seen that grow over the past few years. And actually, uh, women are the most diverse group uh, in the military, and it's also the fastest growing segment of the military. Uh, so you can cover gender and ethnicity with, with both of those. So, uh, and there's also a direct skill set 
uh, correlation in a lot of cases. You have cyber commands that are geographically clustered in areas like uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, Fort Meade, uh, San Antonio, other areas. Uh, so, so certainly getting those uh, people coming out of the military, a lot of them already have security clearances as well, which I know a lot of employers, Tony, we talked about that earlier with Align, um, you know, those are definitely highly valued. Um, the other thing I'll mention is participating uh, at the local level and hosting events for uh, groups that focus, uh, focus on uh, diversity and inclusion. I'll give you an example. So the uh, inter former International Consortium of Minority Cybersecurity Professionals, um, they were one of the first organizations we reached out to uh, as Purdue when we went after our Department of Labor uh, grant. And the first event I actually attended once uh, the grant was awarded was hosted by one of their employer partners, Palo Alto Networks, it's out in Silicon Valley. And I got to learn a lot more about their organization and what they do with chapters nationwide. And there's, there's a lot more examples than that. Uh, the good news is, if anybody's interested in that particular organization, because uh, ICMCP is a hard enough acronym, much less the longer name, they have recently rebranded as Cyversity, which I think is uh, a pretty cool name. So definitely would, uh, would um, check into that. And the last thing I'd mention is just promote your success stories. You know, peers like seeing their peers through their lens succeed. So anytime you've got something from a, a DEI perspective, promote that. All right, uh, last prepared question here, and I'm gonna open it up to, to all panelists, so, so chime in. Uh, what are some ways that cyber leaders can be mentors to those entering the field? I mean, I guess the first thing is just be open to mentoring. Um, I personally, you know, for me being retired Air Force myself and cyber being so popular and, and in demand field, I do get a lot of questions. I participate on LinkedIn mentor groups and, and uh, there's a program called Veterati for, for uh, matching mentors with mentees. And I participate in that. And, and that's one of the key areas I focus on now. I also participate with our companies. We do college outreach for college hiring and we have our own diversity network and everything. So that's what we have to do is, is promote and be open to doing that mentoring. And for me, giving those mentees the, the real world practical experience from our viewpoint, but also encourage them to seek out those other perspectives with other mentors and, and you know, really I emphasize self-reflection. They have to understand what it is they want out of their career or their potential career. What's their, you know, and, and help them guide them in their first steps and let them figure out from that first step where they want to pivot to the next point in their career. But I first, first thing is we all have to be available and promote our ability to mentor or willingness to mentor. Uh, you know, I, what I'll say about that is I think mentoring is so important, but it also requires, and, and I tell many people this, it requires a certain amount of of acumen and sagacity in order to mentor the right way. And, and I mean by that is there's a certain level of authenticity that I think mentors should have. And so from my perspective, as, as a woman in this industry and as a woman of color, it's understanding the challenges that we all face and that I face in particular because uh, of the diversity and then being able to mentor and motivate and inspire in spite of those. So having those hard conversations, um, telling your story about what I've seen and what I've overcome, and then being able to really build a relationship with these students or other women in technology or, or these groups to say, this is what I've seen. This is the power of diversity within this field and the, the challenges that we can overcome and you can do it too. So really having those true, very authentic conversations um, on various levels, I think it's extremely important in this field and especially in mentoring. I'll mention a couple of things. You know, one is, um, especially because of, uh, you know, the aging workforce that we mentioned before, but being willing to take a step back and, and, and take an honest look at the demographics that are out there um, and, and then investing into upskilling your workforce. Uh, we work with a lot of local municipalities as an example that have small IT departments, especially cyber, three to five people. And in a lot of cases, uh, the, the CISO or the person running the organization is a 60 year old man, more cases than not Caucasian. And uh, it's been, I guess, 
really heartfelt for me when we have got into laying out how our program works, if they're willing to be a guinea pig and to go through that PCAP program, because they know they're going to retire out in a year or two, and it's important to be able to kind of train their replacements. So I, I have enjoyed that aspect of it. So that's something I would encourage. And, and, and I'll wrap up with kind of expanding on something Tony said on the military. You know, we talked about establishing those programs earlier, but it's especially important for organizations that do want to recruit from the military to provide that mentorship. Um, statistically proven that they'll stay with you longer if there's a veteran affinity group or a veteran uh, employee resource group within an organization. Thankfully, there's some good local and, and national resources for that. Uh, here in New York City, you've got uh, veterans on Wall Street. They're tied in with the Bob Woodruff Foundation. Um, and uh, I think they even have a virtual symposium that's coming up next month. Uh, nationally, there are a lot of great resources. One I'll mention is PsychArmor, which has an entire library of video-based training for creating corporate culture, uh, which also includes how to create a military-friendly or veteran-ready organization. Right. Any questions from the audience? So I, I grew up in an era where computer science was actually a single degree. Now it's multiple. So I grew up in a time where computer science was a single degree, but now it's like 20 different degrees. And so cybersecurity is the same way. Um, my question is actually about high school guidance counselors and the guidance and the, and the advisors at college. How do you teach them? recognize what oh, skills uh, a student is best based for. <laughs> I, I'll take it first. I'll, I'll admit this. It's a missing link. We, we talk about this a lot with, with just general work we do with apprenticeships, that you have to get those guidance counselors, uh, and they're not up to speed. To your point, uh, Tony and I were talking about this earlier. If you look at, at the jobs for cybersecurity, people think, oh, it's cool, I want to go into cyber. Well, what do you want to do in cybersecurity? And, and peeling the layers of that onion back, I don't necessarily have the, the answer of how best to communicate that to the guidance counselors, but I know it's needed. And to that point, what about Okay. Um, what about the other college, the other disciplines, right? The legal, the finance teams that all need to also learn what cyber is because as they go to lead businesses, understanding the importance of understanding cybersecurity and what that means to their functions within a, in a business. I think that um, comes down to, and, and even with guidance counselor, it comes, comes down to us in a profession, raising our hands and volunteering to educate them. So I do this for, my kids' teachers um, and various schools and various organizations. So I encourage anyone, um, because we're all in this and we all have a common threat actor, I am always encourage people, reach out to me. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Let's have a discussion. And I'll do that after hours or before hours on weekends. But it really is um, part of my responsibility as, as someone within this field to help educate others on it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do the same thing uh, at our school, the school district that, that um, you know, my kids go to, they actually have a cybersecurity trade skill where they get, I think at the end of it, like an A plus or a net plus certification. So I do, you know, I, I do reach out to the instructors, you know, or those class saying, hey, if you want something to come in from the industry and give a talk to the students, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, I'm not even sure if the parents are going to Great American Teaching, which was at the middle school level. I always participate in that. And that was you know, I would talk to about my experience in the military and then also what I did in the military, which was IT and cyber and everything else. So I think, you know, Tammy's absolutely correct. It's a matter of us as the industry reaching out to them to help them because we all know no one's going to know everything. If you do, you'd be running your own company, you know, making millions of dollars. And I know I'm not in that position. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so no one's, no one's going to know everything, but the least we can do is reach out and, and share what we do know. Yeah as part of that collective. Yeah, and I ought to say more and more companies now, you're seeing this from a governance perspective. I know uh, here, here in New York also is the Society for Corporate Governance. I went to one of their events a while back and you know, everybody's being attacked. Every industry is trying to protect something, whether it's intellectual property, whether it's infrastructure for medical devices, medical records, whatever it may be. So it's definitely a hot topic. You do have more people available and within an organization where it's emphasized that would be available to do just that. 
Can I just ask as a follow on to kind of Tanya's comments. So it's for me, it's not just about the existing people who um, are in like a chief financial officer position or in those kind of senior executive positions. It's what I think we hear a lot about in terms of filling the workforce gap is on the very uber technically minded person. And there's not a large conversation that's happening or, or there's not even kind of a conversation that's happening around like communicators. And we, you know, she mentioned lawyers, people who have more of the soft skills, but have, you know, a wide across the spectrum understanding of cybersecurity, but not necessarily a deep in any one, you know, kind of row or column, I guess, or sphere. Um, but how can, how, like, what would be your perspective on how we can talk to, you know, kids and the next generation about that the, there's importance in, in those skills being tied to cyber also? And I'll just give a quick example. Like, we just recently hired on my team a ninth or 10th grade social studies teacher, and she's helping in our kind of training and awareness group. And she's like the perfect person for it, right? Because she knows how to talk to teenagers, which is like pretty horrible. And, um, <laughs> and as, a, as a swim coach myself, right? So I'm well versed in like the talking to teenagers thing. Um, but she's been able to translate those skills really easily and just learn the subject matter, right? So I always say you can't hire, the, you can't teach someone to be an extrovert, right? Like you either are or you aren't. Um, you're either really good at talking to people or you're not kind of thing. Um, but you can teach somebody any subject matter. But I just don't think that conversation's happening happening kind of in the collegiate as well as K through 12 environment to say, you may be performing really strongly in a social kind of science skill, but that can translate into this field too. And then kind of making pathways for that as well, right? Like in the security organization where I work, I, I work for our chief information security officer, but I do more of the soft skill cyber side, right? And letting people know that there is a job pathway for them too. So I would just ask like your thoughts around how we could as a collective here, make those, you know, because awareness is more of that soft scale, right? It's a non super technical in many ways. So how can we kind of make that conversation louder and more amplified so that people kind of in the back yeah. can hear it? I, I think first and foremost, we change the narrative. So I always um, kind of try and tell people those soft skills are, are not really um, that prevalent in a lot of organizations. And I think they're extremely important. That those soft skills are what get us the seat at the boardroom tables. Those soft skills help us translate cybersecurity to those CFOs and the CEOs and those entrepreneurs. It's not the technical skills. I'm, I'm not gonna get up there and talk about zero day vulnerabilities and expect a, a standing ovation. It's not gonna happen. So it's really understanding what our, what our trade is, what our skill set is, and using the ability to influence and the ability to communicate across various boards and, and uh, various audiences and really driving that point home and delivering value in a way that they can interpret and that they can really take away with them. So I, I think it's using our skill sets to um, translate what we do and how what they're doing can really benefit this, this entire cybersecurity defense and help make us more secure and vigilant and resilient. And it's using the entire body, not just the technical skill set, not just the soft skill set. When I, when I got my MBA, there are no technical uh, classes that they, they offer there. You pay a ton of money for a lot of different things and not one coding class. So it really is using each of those, using that, that uh, uh, social studies teachers, ability to communicate or ability to look at very complex problems and break them down. Those are all very and hugely important in what we do. Yeah, and I'll just add to that too, right? It's what we started in the beginning. It's the paradigm shift, right? Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity or InfoSec 10, 15 years ago, if you're going to make an investment, you're going to maybe pay a firewall guy, right? Yeah. You know, that's kind of where the program, but as we see this paradigm shift, as we see programs maturing and, you know, CISOs or CIOs having that C, you know, with the CEO and being really part of the leadership, you also are now seeing that investment to exactly your point. You're willing to invest in that social studies teacher to help communicate. And as the programs mature, you have that flexibility to be able to do that. Yeah, Great question. I, I think that helps at an organization by organization level. So if you're in that role, in that cybersecurity role within your company, I mean, it's what, what I do. I, you know, half, half my day in my job is reaching out cross-functionally within the organization saying, hey, sales team, hey, legal, you know, what are the questions you guys are having here? What can I help you with? What, you know, I need this from you. What is it that will make your job easier to help me in the long run, right? It's being that, the willingness to reach out and work with them and, and offer our ability to, to educate them as much as we can to the level that they're comfortable with, right? Obviously, 
I'm not going to go down to, to packet sniffing and, and queuing theory and the network traffic and how to make that all with, with, with the legal team, unless he wants to, like it's a hobby, but <laughs> the likelihood of that is not, you know, is not there, but you know, it's to the level that they need to do their job. And that's going to obviously help you because all those are supporting functions to what we all do as cybersecurity and our understanding of where we fit within that overall organization. You know, in the business perspective, we all have to tie everything to the business objectives of that organization. Yep. And that's going to be key. How do we translate what we know to that, to that level of understanding? All right. Well, I want to thank the panelists. We are thank at you. time. This is a great conversation. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you for, Thanks for having us. All right. We're adjourned.